Hi everyone, Top 10 Time is here again. Every month a topic is voted for by my patrons and this month it is the Top 10 Uwe Rosenberg Games, one of my favourite designers of all time. Not like he's underrated or anything, one of the most lauded for game designers uh, of modern times, I imagine. Maybe uh, the person who invented chess of all time. Plato or something. Anyway, let's get on with things. Speaking of Patreon, if you'd like to help me keep making videos, I've made like 450 playthroughs, loads of top tens, all sorts of stuff, live things I'm doing now. All of this is made possible thanks to uh, the patrons. Thank you very much if you have supported the channel and if you're in a position to, and you'd like to, those two things are very important, then uh, please consider helping out and keeping all of this going. Five more years and uh, the funds this month definitely go towards a haircut. So let's get on with uh, Uwe's stuff, right? Number 10 is Aura et Labora, which actually got playthroughed quite recently for the purposes of this top 10. I mentioned live videos, so you can watch me uh, do a solo playthrough of Aura et Labora. This is, as many of Uwe's games are, this is a farming game uh, set in uh, past times. <laughs> Describes a lot of them. Uh, but we are monks trying to build buildings. Marty has just entered the room, very interested in his farming games as our cat. Uh, and there's some spatial building elements. You have all of these cards representing buildings. Certain buildings have to be next to other buildings, like your cloister buildings have to be next to others. Some buildings want to be in certain terrain types. You can buy more land to build things on if you can afford all of the stuff. And this resource wheel determines not just what you can get, but what everyone can get in a multiplayer game as well. So every round the resource wheel will tick and make more of certain resources available, of all of the resources available to everybody. And when you say chop wood in your particular area, the wood marker for everybody gets reset back down to zero. So it's a nice little twist on, we'll mention some of his other games later, but in games where resources build up in say worker placement spaces, and you can see, oh, well, this is, uh, I, I, it's not really worth me going to get it now when I'm only gonna get a couple of wood, but oh wow, there's there's like six wood here now. Do I, that's, that's just enough to do what I want to do. Can I risk waiting till next turn? Can I risk getting something else done first? Or if somebody else takes that away from me first, it's gonna get reset back down to zero and I'm gonna have to wait ages to do all of this again. So there is a nice tension that is built in there uh, where you know a lot of uh, games that well, I like in general could be uh, criticized for multiplayer solitaire and uh, that's that's a plus for me. But certainly the actual building of the stuff is uh, is a solitaire endeavor, but the, the resource wheel is a nice source of interaction as is the fact that you can use anyone's buildings. You do have to give them a gift. You have to pay them coins or later on in the game, whiskey or wine, and you get to use their buildings. You, you make them, uh, it puts uh, their worker on their building and you get its benefit. So there is that element of it as well. There are, there are two variants built into the game, uh, France and Ireland. My copy, if you've seen the playthrough, is actually a French copy that I apparently only half pasted up. Back when the game was long, long out of print, it has been uh, reprinted since then and is a lot more available, I think. Uh, so yeah, I, sh I should have waited, but it would have been uh, it would have been years of waiting. And, and who could have waited when you're new and hungry for board games? Uh, so that is uh, a big plus as well that it's got two completely different uh, variants built in. But I would say that it's not going to be a problem for loads of plays uh, in terms of variability. It's going to do you for a long time, depending on, uh, especially in the multiplayer, who gets these buildings when, whose you are able to use, what kind of production chain you can get yourself. That is all going to make a massive difference. But the buildings are always going to be the same. They're all going to come out in the same there's not an order they come out it's just you know it's it's phase a now it's settlement phase a okay the a buildings come out they all come out they're all available to everyone at once and so as i say it's not going to be like okay i've seen all of these buildings that's it there is going to be a lot of uh, variables going on based on what players do but yeah bear in mind that sooner or later it's always going to be those buildings and uh yeah it's it's like 10 years since the game now and it's not had an expansion or anything, but hey, maybe uh, maybe you're into big multiplayer games and uh, there's someone always throwing a spanner in the works. But hey, Aura at Labora, that is number 10. Number 9 is a new re-entry for me. It is Fields of Arla, which I'm hopefully now pronouncing right. 
and I would say it has the potential to climb up even higher, especially now that I have played its expansion, uh, T and Trade, which I think enhances it even further. But uh, this is a game that we had back when it came out. I can't remember why now, it's years and years ago. Decided this isn't for us anymore. I got rid of it after many, many requests for a playthrough of it. I got it back. I got hold of its expansion, which has been out of print for a while. And I did a playthrough of that uh, very recently. That's probably went up a few days ago on the channel. Actually, you could check that out surprisingly uh, quick when it's solo and edited right down. But in this game, we are farmers <laughs> in the past uh, and we have these uh, these great boards. It's primarily a two player game. The expansion does add a third player option and of course the solo. Uh, but we have our great big long farms where the, the sea is encroaching on our land. And one of the key elements of the game is pushing back these dikes to get more and more land space. A lot of Uwe's games start out, you know, you have this restricted amount of space. Can you, uh, can you free it up? As uh, I'll talk about in some of these other games as well. Can you get rid of the, the peat and uh, plant more grain and stuff in your field of Arla? So the the game, it, it does have uh, some differences built in. Some buildings will be the same. Certain sections of buildings will be different every game. And there's more variety added on with the expansion as well. But it is kind of the, the first one, I think, first of everybody's games to start with this, uh, this great big uh, board of worker placement spots where it is divided into summer and winter. And there are all different places that you can go. A lot of them require tools which you can upgrade. So you can come and turn your wool into uh, actual fabric. Uh, that's gonna, you're gonna be able to do it more times the more tools that you've got. You're gonna be able to push back more of the dikes the more tools that you've got. But the, the T expansion adds ways around that. So like in, uh, again, I've talked about a lot recently, Alubari, uh, you can give T to your workers when they go to these places and you don't have to necessarily upgrade these tools anymore because powered by the tea as they are depending on whether it's uh, just uh, cheap tea or the east frisian tea they get to act as if those tools have been upgraded and if you give them enough east frisian tea you can just double up on the action so even if you do go for upgrading those things, if you upgrade all the way and then take a massive double action, opens up loads and loads of possibilities. So it is a game where you are kind of left to your own devices. In a multiplayer game, you know, the other, what the other person is doing can guide you, what the other person is blocking off, what's going to be available to you. There are chances to do things again. There's an imitate spot where you can take an action that's already been taken up. In the multiplayer game, you can take an action that is in the, the wrong season. Once per round, you can uh, go onto the other side of the board. Solo, you're not allowed to do that. You're more uh, restricted in it, but still, you know, the world's your oyster. You'll be guided a little bit by the buildings that have come out and the buildings that are always there, depending on whether you're playing with the base game or the expansion. And a lot of the game is just left open to you. So I wonder if that was kind of a thing earlier on that I thought it was maybe just too open and a bit uh, aimless and stuff. I'll say I haven't felt that going back at all. I felt, and, and there is, you know, still that newness to it, although it is, you know, revisiting a game, it does feel new. I've, I've played. I said at the beginning, I've played hundreds of games because uh, of uh, a voracious appetite for new games anyway, but to make videos for the channel and stuff. And so, yeah, it did feel uh, refreshing and exciting coming back to it. And especially, you know, I've, I've played it a few times with just the base game to get reacquainted to it. And then when I added the tea and trade on top of it, as well as being able to get the wagons to upgrade your stuff and you send them out to uh, far off places that want certain uh, resources, you, you get food from doing that, which you need to feed your people. You can turn into all sorts of stuff. But also when your wagons come back from these far off places, they fill up a track that can be worth points as well. as all of your buildings and your resources that you've got left over. But this, uh, the Tea and Trade Act expansion adds uh, training boats where you can go off to these even further off places. And if you've got spaces left in your boat, then you can get tree and upgraded wood and stuff. Just loads and loads more options in this to uh, just make it uh, very, very different. Even though, yeah, it's uh, you, you're being you're being su more subtly guided in Fields of Arla than uh, some of the other games, I think. But yeah, absolutely fantastic. Raring to go for more. Field of Arla, number nine. Number eight is Glass Road, 
which is another resource wheel game. Here, uh, all the players have an individual resource wheel that tracks how much stuff that you've got. We are, you know, we're kind of farmers in the past. <laughs> so uh, trying to make uh, glass and bricks and then things from those glass and bricks. So we have these uh, resource wheels, uh, playthroughs for all of these so far, by the way, you sh you'll, you'll have seen them, won't you? They're by my head right now. What am I doing? Uh, so in this, we each have these resource wheels rather than individual tokens that are going to track everything that you've got. But the, the resource wheels have a, a nice little extra function in that you have separate ones, one for glass and one for bricks. And when you have made when you when you've got enough resources that would make a glass or a brick so there will be a gap next to the you know the spoke of the wheel as soon as there is that gap a brick or glass is automatically made that wheel will automatically turn and you will get that and so it is not only a great smart little way of uh having this uh, this this production done for you uh, a way of making you remember it as well it's also something to bear in mind when you are gaining resources in this game that <laughs> is the gaining of this resource going to be ultimately bad for me because it's going to produce one of these things that means that I'm not going to have the stuff that I need anymore so that's uh, one big thing about it but another thing is the the actual gameplay of it is very very different to uh, other Uwe games so in similarities, we have these player boards. They are mostly, I think you've got about two spaces free. They are mostly chock-a-block with uh, forests and whatnot clogging things up, although they can be very useful as well. They can be fundamental to some of the actions in the game. Uh, and over the course of the game, we'll be clearing some of those things out, adding some other things, building some buildings that will allow us to uh, convert resources, earn points from things. Uh, but the actual core gameplay is this this card game. We all have this uh, great big set of action cards and you will take a certain number into a round with you, leave the others behind, and then on your turn, you will play a card and then you go around and see, did anyone else bring that card into the round with them? If they did, they get to play the card for free outside their turn. So potentially are getting more actions done and you don't get to do as much. There are two actions on each card and if other people get to do them, everybody gets to choose one of the actions on those cards. If you were the only person that played that card though, you get to do all of that card by yourself. So there is an extra element in the game of, and it's a little bit different for two players, and obviously it's, it's not there in the solo, uh, but there is an element of trying to second guess what your opponents are doing, what they are going for. Are they building up a load of the, you know, the, the, the sandy areas? And you can see that they are going to play the card that rewards them with a load of resources for all uh, of those that they've produced. So do you play that as well? Is it useful enough for you to get that for free? Because it's the only way that you are going to get you know, the maximum number of actions is if you have predicted, you, know, you get your cards to play. And I think it's you're allowed a maximum of two outside your turns so if you have you know predicted badly you're not going to get as many actions as everyone else especially if the cards that you did play on your turns everyone else brought as well and so they got to play as extras and reduce the number of things you got to do and yeah it, it can be sometimes vital to you that uh, you know this card that you you needed you desperately needed to do both things of it. So the timing is very important as well. You want to get your resources and stuff before you do the buildings, of course, but you're also trying to maybe wait out your opponents as well. You know, in case they did bring that card, maybe uh, I will get to play it for free outside of my turn instead. Uh, because, uh, yeah, when you're forced to do that, it can be a bad thing as well that, you know, I desperately wanted to play this and get both of the actions on it, or I needed to do it in a certain order, and oh, the, someone else has brought that card and played it first, and now I've got to play it down, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a very different thing to any of his other games. I found that, it's, yeah, it's, it's maybe slipped a little bit in rankings. I thought uh, it would have been a lot higher maybe a couple of years ago. That is to do with uh, some of the other games as well. But I think that's something to do with as, as much as different it is, and I think as, as good as that system of trying to work out what your opponents are doing is, I'm, I'm not very good at it. And so that might be the, the, the fundamental block in there. But I'd say that the main reason it's solo is just because the other games 
are so much higher. And that's the way these lists work, isn't it? And there can only be 10. I know, you know, put in the comments what uh, games I'm going to be missing after this 10, because Uwe has designed many more than 10 games, as I'm sure you know. Number seven is Makata, which I think is a bit of an anomaly to a lot of these other games, certainly to Uwe's kind of medium Euro-y uh, wheelhouse games in that you know you're, you're not farming it's got you know, a different art style to all of these other things it's it's yeah it's it hasn't really got anything else familiar from the other games i don't really think uh, in makata you are traders that are traveling the world for goods and you have contracts all over the world as well that, that you are trying to satisfy with these goods as you travel to different places the further out they are the more time they will cost you. Time is a crucial thing in this game. If you go to things that are closer by, you might earn time to then help you go to these further out places later on. And the the locations are all interconnected as well. So when you visit a certain location, you can grab all of the cubes off it. Each color of cube represents uh, a few different items on your player board. And you, there are some restrictions, but you get to define what they are because you need specific items for the contract. Uh, but when you go to pick up all of those cubes, you generate cubes in the locations that are touching that one as well. So there is some nice management of time. There are all these interconnected places that you, know, you might need to go to a place, but is it going to make another place too good and it's going to really help someone else? And then you have the, the contract system, where which I could completely accept maybe has, uh, well, definitely has some look of the draw in it. There are all these levels of contracts. Start out very simple, only want you to get a few things. When you complete a contract, you start to kind of progress. If you complete you know, a level one contract, you then get a level two contract as well. And you start to progress to these more and more difficult things. And the game is a race to complete uh, the contract of the highest level. So you can see you know, where your opponents are at, what they might be going for, which places they might be able to help you out with. You can uh, get special powers as well, additional cubes when you visit certain uh, locations. You can get buildings that will reward you with points for having done certain things. But uh, yeah, I'd, I <laughs> maybe it's uh, a, a case of rooting for the underdog a little bit, uh, but I've, I've it, it was a, a hard one to get hold of. It might still be. I don't think uh, this one has been reprinted still. Uh, you can watch my playthrough, though, and uh, play vicariously uh, through that. I hope it will be one day because, yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a bit of a bit of buried treasure, a bit of a forgotten gem in uh, Uwe's oeuvre. Hey, <laughs> we've got the puns. Uh, yeah, Makata. Number six is the most recent release on this list. It is his big uh, heavy Euro from last year, Halatau. Uh, which I've done two playthroughs on this channel for, a two-player one and a solo one. And so, yes, maybe it's got a bit of uh, new hotness driving up. Maybe uh, the fact that it hasn't been around a while, it's going to you know, shoot up the rankings as uh, time goes on. Who knows? At the moment, it's at number six. So Halito, theme-wise, I get it. You might say, you know, just like a load of these other things. Art-wise, yes, it looks like uh, a lot of other Uwe games. We are farming, we are placing workers, we've got cards and stuff. So what for any of this? Well, I think, and I, and I have seen kind of since, you, know, you can, for all these ones that I've done playthroughs for, I've done first impressions videos as well, where you can kind of get my, uh, my thoughts uh, for maybe a bit longer on the individual games. But for Halatau, I did kind of see uh, a bit of, and no, no game is for everyone, of course, I did kind of see some comments around, you know, around the topic of oh, same old, same old, you know, it's, it's elements from these games, it's, it's more of the same. And I was, uh, I was kind of surprised by that because I, it doesn't really feel like any of Uwe's other games mechanically, definitely, as I mentioned, you know, theme wise and stuff, yes we are fundamentally doing the, the the same things in that way. But the way that we go about them, I think is very different. And it's a different kind of emphasis on cards. Uh, a, a couple of other games I'm going to mention have uh, their own emphasis on uh, emphases on cards. And um, I don't think there has ever been uh, such a prevalence as there is in Halatau. And it kind of, I, I mentioned this in my uh, videos 
specifically on the game that it didn't kind of come out in the first couple of plays of it you're kind of playing it more like a standard worker placement game like he uh, has made plenty of times very very well and then having the cards as a secondary thing bringing the cards to the forefront a lot of these cards can be played at any time with some caveats of course the, the rule book does emphasize like, you can do this at any time apart from these times when you can't uh, but yeah a lot of the cards can be played at any time uh, even outside your turn some cards even relate to the worker placement board and the state of certain action spaces and you know the, a lot of the cards want you to have things rather than spend things and what this kind of does is fill you with a load of short and medium term goals there are also points cards that you can get that can be long term goals because they are kind of harder to do maybe they want you to give up stuff that you don't really want to do until uh, you have to but it's full of uh, constant little nudges if you can get into a position where you've got a nice flow you, know, you you of course won't be able to just play all of your cards very easily but very very often you just have to kind of veer off a little bit to be able to satisfy this card and then the reward that you get from it kind of it starts to snowball that oh now i can do this now i will get this now i've got this income card that gives me uh, a sheep every round uh, and so now maybe i want to think about what's going to happen to these sheep where, where are they going to go in a few rounds because uh, if you don't do something about it they will uh, die of old age if you don't have uh, uh, some skills that will help out with that the worker placement is a bit different as well it is worker placement spots this great big grid of them but it's not you know, old fashioned worker placement where it's there is a space as soon as somebody is there, that is it. Uh, there are one, two, and three worker spaces in most of the actions. And so, depending on how popular an action is, it will cost you more and more workers. So, then you have to decide not just is this action available for me, and sometimes all of the spaces will be taken up by them, but how valuable is that action to me? Is it worth me paying three of my workers and especially earlier on in the game you don't start with very many workers is it worth me giving up so many workers to do this action or is there another action that i can get similar things with there are a lot of ways of getting what you want in this sometimes it's through the cards sometimes it's through slightly different actions and i think it all comes together absolutely beautifully and the the kind of it's, it's not the only way that you will get points. It's kind of the fundamental thing that you are doing. You will get loads of points and bonuses and things from cards on top of that. But the fundamental thing you will get done is move this community center along your board. There are a load of these craft buildings that want different resources in the game, different combinations of them. Some are more specific, more of this than this. Some just want, you know, a, a, these are your options. Give me some of those. Uh, they progressively get more expensive as the game goes along, just costing you one resource per movement at the start of the game, but towards the end of the game, more and more and more. But you can get discounts if you give certain combinations of goods. There are these stones in the way that stop you just moving buildings loads, so you've got to get tools to be able to move those stones. Yeah, it all just comes together absolutely beautifully. It's got so many cards in it as well. It's got all of these different kind of uh, sets of cards. You can't mix them all together, but just from being able to pick between those, there's there's there's, there's so much variety just in uh, just in one of those decks anyway. So being able to just pick and choose between uh, those is a fantastic plus, as well as uh, one of the types of decks is split by one is split by theme but one is split by difficulty as well so a, a deck that will be great for just easing into it more simple uh, actions and rewards and stuff and uh, progressively more and more difficult ones as you get more used to the game and uh, want to take things up a notch i think it's absolutely fantastic how it's out so number five is at the gates of low yang which is a game about farming, yes, but um, kind of on a smaller scale. We are trying to uh, plant vegetables. When you plant them, you'll get more of that particular one, depending on the size of your field. And certain fields can only have certain vegetables in them. Uh, you know, usually the, the more valuable the resource, the fewer that you can plant. And you will get those off of your fields every round and you are trying to satisfy customers. We'll get customers over the course of this, some just one-off customers, some repeat customers that will want the same thing delivered to them many times that can get, uh, you know, they, they will be satisfied if you deliver to them uh, when they expect it. If you don't, they can get dissatisfied. They can penalize you as well if you, uh, if you make a commitment and then you don't uh, manage to stick to it. Uh, the, the planting thing, by the way, is uh, kind of re-implemented in uh, Reichholt 
uh, which I did a playthrough for too. Uh, but yeah, I, I like how everything comes together in Lo Yang much, much better because uh, Lo Yang has got another card system that I think is very different to any of Uwe's other games in that you will have a hand of these cards that will be a mixture of bonuses for you, uh, new fields perhaps, uh, new customers of the different types. You will have all of these uh, in your hand, uh, but you just you can't choose cards just from your hand to take into the round with you. If you spot something that you like, you have to take a card from your hand and a card from the central display as well, which means if, if the two perfect things for you have come out, you have got to lay it in the middle and hope that nobody is going to take it from you. Hope that it's not going to be the perfect thing. You've got to act all blasé about it, that it's it's not really the thing that you're after, of course. Or try and wait it out. Try and just play cards to the centre, hoping that everyone will. Because as soon as people have taken their cards, that's it. They're out of the... All the rest of their cards go into the middle there, giving you a load more options. But maybe they've got the perfect thing for them. So uh, another way around it is to wait them out as well until you're the last person in there. And then you will get what you want. Uh, it's... Uh, as, as with all of these uh, games that I've mentioned so far, I'm primarily a uh, two-player player, player. <laughs> solo as well. I'm uh, quite big on increasingly so lately. Uh, and yeah, w they all work fantastically with two players. Uh, there's a lovely scoring system in this where you know you have this uh, you have a score track that you can go up. It costs you uh, a single coin to get to the next space each round, but then the, each space after that costs the number on it in coins. So it can be really valuable trying to shoot up that scoring track early on uh, because then your free one coin movement is, uh, is saving you loads because you're at the higher numbers. But you've probably had to sacrifice some kind of uh, preliminary work, some kind of preparation, uh, some long term stuff, uh, investment in having uh, fields that have got more things in them. It just works absolutely beautifully. And yes, there's, there's been a playthrough for everything so far at the gates of Lo Yang. Number four, we're going to take a bit of a sidestep from the kind of uh, medium, bigger box Euro that I am, that is, is my uh, favourite kind, really. But uh, my fourth favourite Uwe Rosenberg game is Patchwork, a tiny box two-player only game, which uh, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not. I seem to remember that you know, an another game of uh, Uwe's that may be coming up in a bit <laughs> involved a load of these polyomino pieces. And while that was still ready and maybe to get uh, people ready for this idea, Patchwork was released in the meantime in, in a previous year. Uh, but uh, this is a much lighter game than any of these that I've mentioned, a much easier game. It's, it's incredibly easy to, uh, to learn. We start off with some empty quilts. We start off with a load of uh, polyomino, you know, tetrisy shaped pieces that are just in a great big circle around the board. We have uh, a big uh, wooden marker by some of them. On your turn, you can pick any of the next three pieces along in the circle. Pieces have a cost in buttons, the, the kind of uh, one of the currencies of the game. Uh, you will get uh, more over the course of the game depending on certain uh, pieces that you've taken. Uh, so they will, they will cost a combination between buttons and time. And so buttons you just have to pay from buttons that you have. Uh, and time moves you along this board that you are both on. Uh, and is is the timer for the game. The, the, the amount of time it takes you to build that piece uh, is progressively moving you further and further towards the center, which will end the game. It's also, you know, a, a time track game in that sense, because the person going next is the person in last place on this uh, time board. So it can be beneficial to you to take a piece that is really cheap on time, so you can maybe double up on action. Joe, it, is this piece that is costing you no buttons, but a ton of time worth it because the other player is going to get a load of turns and maybe the pieces uh, that are left over just aren't going to be good for you because as with uh, a lot of these uh, polyomino games, of which uh, Uwe has made uh, plenty himself now, uh, you know, may maybe you just haven't got the space for them anymore the way that you have gone. You have to bear in mind as things get going as well, the, the three that are available, if you buy this certain piece, that's where the marker goes. So okay, then these will be the three that are available, and I really want this one, but I know that the other player is going to skip past that one, and you know, how can I plan it so that the thing I want is still going to be available to me and not just make things perfectly for the other player? 
as well as all of that there are spaces on the time track with these kind of tiny one by one spaces that are perfect for filling in the gaps but you've got to be the first along there but speeding along might not be the best thing there are spaces when you skip over them you'll get income you'll get more buttons based on how many buttons are on the pieces that you've taken so another uh, variable into picking your piece is not just the shape that you want you're racing to you want to fill as many spaces as possible you'll lose points for all the spaces you didn't fill at the end of the game but you're also trying to race to do like a seven by seven square to get a big points bonus uh, you're trying to get uh, as many buttons on the pieces as possible because they will uh, th their income every every button on a piece will get you a button whenever we have the income it's uh, such a simple system but it is so elegant so beautifully done you know just these uh, these same pieces in a different order every time it's so easy to pick up but there is so much behind it after that it's just uh, it's a beautiful production as well it's a joy to look at as you're building your quilts and you've got your finished things at the end of the game it just works absolutely beautifully and uh, yeah as much as i like the the heavy side of things a lot of the time it uh, shows you how uh, beautiful the simplicity of uh, patchwork can be number three is noosefjord a game that's yeah as i said with others a game that has risen and risen in uh, rankings over the years in my estimation over the years and i quite liked it to begin with but if you go back to my original video i don't know if i've done a couple of first impressions of this i had a few gripes uh, with uh, noosefjord Fjord at the time as much as i liked it which I don't think I have now at all. I think I was wrong back then. If only I could just insert a little thing saying that I've changed my mind about some of this stuff now. There'd be a fair few videos that uh, would be updated in that fashion then. So in Noosefjord, we are, you know, the, the player boards might uh, remind you a lot of uh, Glass Road. We have uh, player boards with not very much space on them, loads of uh, big forest pieces in the way. And we will be trying to put these uh, little building cards on them over the course of the game. But a lot of it aside from that is different. There's no cards that we're playing. It's a worker placement game. We have this uh, board of worker placement spots we have uh, with with fishermen we get fish as income every turn the the more we improve our our fleet our fishing boats then we will get more and more fish as income it doesn't necessarily all come to you though there are shares in this game where other players can buy shares and you have to give them some fish some fish has to go to your storage some fish can go into your actual kind of spending place you have to take actions to get fish out of your storage into the the spendable area uh, you can get money as well uh, you get uh, you can you can collect money from the the money that other players have uh, paid for shares you can get these elders these uh, these special uh, fantastic fishermen that can give you different bonuses and access to different actions uh, and then the the core of things after that is the different levels of buildings so there are there are buildings that will uh, just get you things there are buildings that will help you convert things into other things and then ultimately revealed later on in the game there are buildings that can score you big points and so one great thing and with uh, with a few uve games one great thing is that expansions and there have been a couple for new steward at the moment expansion can just be a deck of cards it's just a whole new array of buildings nothing fundamentally has to change about the game or get added and there are some expansions where you know talks about fields of honor and stuff where adding all of these things was great but uh, just the fact that it's a whole new array of cards can completely change the game based on what's available the elders are always the same i think it would be nice i don't know if i've got the second expansion actually maybe there were new elders in that it'd be nice if some of those change sometimes because based on the player count you get different elders in different orders you get more available uh, but at a lower player count you're going to see the same ones a lot that's a that's a little thing about it still but it's it's a it's a minor quibble uh, i did i uh, in my original video i didn't really like how the the sea buildings came out later on in the game and you know maybe you know if you just get lucky and one's perfect for you then uh, it, it can come down to luck in that but i think that there's a lot more in what you've done to prepare for that eventuality uh, that uh, comes into play kind of how not if you've specifically got things ready in case you draw a building but in case you have you covered your bases have you got a nice uh, array of abilities and resources from the the half of the game that you have played so far before all of these buildings come out it's another one like uh glass road another similarity is that uh, very a, a much quicker game on uh, a smaller scale but still 
uh, a really meaty game full of uh, tough decisions and yeah absolutely fantastic it's number three so it's got to be good hasn't it Noosefjord number two is A Feast for Odin another one along the lines of uh, Fields of Allah and Halatau in these enormous uh, boxes uh, full of, of pieces. Feast for Odin, probably more than any of them. Uh, this is an absolutely enormous game where we are Vikings on an epic Viking quest. We have, you know, I talked about the worker placement board in Fields of All being big. It's massive in A Feast for Odin. Uh, there's a bit of a twist on worker placement in it and that's this massive, massive grid of actions that you can take is actually not as confusing as it looks. You know, a lot of the actions relate to certain areas of the game, getting uh, food, uh, upgrading tiles. You know, the, the whole game is based on the, it comes with these trays with these goods in them uh, that start out, uh, there's, there's loads of different sizes, but they start out uh, just orange, they start out just red and then get upgraded to orange and then green and then blue and depending on what color they are they can be spent to feed your people and they can be spent to i'm really uh, worried that i've got the order of those uh, food wrong now that of those tiles anyway uh, but yeah they can be used as food they can be placed on your main board your main board as with a load of move race games start with a load of minus points that you need to uh, hopefully clear up by the end of the game or have gotten points elsewhere you can get islands that you can visit that you uh, will get points for you can get little sheds and stuff that will take food uh, different places want different colors of uh, resources in there but another thing about the worker placement board is that it's divided into columns as well so the actions are grouped to similar things but you have more workers than usual and depending on the one two three or four column in the base game anyway uh, it costs you that many vikings to go there you might get to draw or play cards so if you play more and more vikings and the effects of course get more and more powerful but varied as well that it's not always just the same identical action but a bit better it can be uh, a different thing then based on the situation that you are in uh, it can <laughs> really be vital saving those vikings and with all of these extra things available maybe if somebody takes the space you want the the alternative space is going to be too expensive for you now or the particular action isn't going to be available anymore but with so many different things there there is so much available to do there are so many uh, ways to get around kind of road bumps in the game there is again a, a ton of cards in this game so many occupation cards but this is kind of what led us a bit astray when we started playing Halatau. i'm sure that they can be leveraged much better than we have done when we've played or certainly when i have played solo as well we don't tend to play that many cards that there are these huge decks and they can just give you outright bonuses bonuses when you do certain things points all sorts of stuff and yeah when you just get to draw one or two of them who knows if you're going to get one that is useful to you the expansion did add an option where you know even if the cards aren't useful to you you can discard them and get points instead uh, and a lot of points uh, if you are some of the first actions to actually discard your cards that way uh, but yeah i feel like for a game with so many cards they haven't been that much of a factor for me the the kind of main thing is getting all these resources upgrading all these resources as you surround certain spaces on your player board you will start to get bonuses of more resources of more pieces as you go through the game and uh, the pieces are all polyomino pieces it was uh, patchwork when i was being vague about a game that uh, i I heard patchwork had been uh, carved out of uh, that uh, Feast for Odin is uh, just all uh, different shaped pieces that uh, not not so funky uh, patchwork shaped pieces but all different uh, rectangles and squares and stuff uh, there are some pieces some of the the relic pieces the rarer pieces uh, are funky shaped but hey let's not get into all of that stuff let's not get into funky shapes <laughs> but yeah it's all about trying to uh, surround these spaces for bonuses but which bonuses do you give up so you can just fill your minus one spaces in quicker there's a bit of restriction as to how you can cover up these money spaces but you can race up those and get a load of money earned which can be used to buy boats which would normally take actions but if you've got enough cash you can just do it outside of your action or money 
money is money is basically the most flexible thing in the game. You can use it if you haven't got enough stuff to feed your people. Uve loves his uh, you need to feed your people steps and uh, Feast for Odin is a bit more generous than uh, some of his games. We might be talking about a, a harsher one in a minute. Um, but uh, yeah, you still need to feed your people. If you haven't got enough food, you can use money rather than... Uh, it, it's it's a kind of real last resort taking uh, penalty tokens in this because there's a lot of ways that you can get around feeding your people. It can be used to uh, plug gaps as well in your board. If you've left these little one-by-one -one spaces, you can just pop a money in there, which can be vital as well uh, when you just need to fill in one space to be eligible for a bonus. The expansion added a look. It added modular boards. Actually, the the actual main action selection board completely varies based on the player count. There was just I think you got an imitation board where you could copy an action that had already been taken at higher player counts. But the the player board completely changes. You got some you know, personal sheds and stuff. I've done a playthrough for the the original base game and a, a whole playthrough for the game with the expansion turned on as well but this is one that's it's it's to do with how much i enjoyed the game as well it's to do with the time as when it came out too but there are not many games that i've kind of got out and play, played with rach and love but also played solo and kind of for a little while just kind of incessantly wanted to play solo incessantly wanted to go back to and that was enhanced by i believe this is still going on on board game geek maybe not as uh, frequent but on if you go into feast for odin in the forums on board game geek there are a, a group of solo players that come up with these scenarios that like these are the cards that are going to be drawn or this is the situation that you're in these places aren't available and you know to play and see uh, see how many points that you could get not that uh, my lurking self ever posted any of my scores or anything but yeah i definitely had fun uh, playing a load of that i think it is absolutely fantastic and yeah there's there's another expansion another great big expansion on the way i think i don't know i can't remember what that could possibly add but i am um, i'm here for it i want to see as much feast for odin as possible because it is already my second favorite uve rosenberg game and here we are at number one my favorite uve game and, and the, my first Uwe game as well. It's always been number one. It's Agricola, one of my favourites of all time still. I think this is this is my second favourite game. I would have to check in that uh, top 10 of all time video that I did, which maybe should be updated at some point. That's uh, by the by though. Agricola, it's always been Agricola. I'm get into the whole big story of it, but early on into our trip into board games, we hadn't really had that many games. I had to decide a game to get, to ask for as a, as a present. I had made possibly my first trip onto Board Game Geek, baffled as I was looking at everything, and they have a ranking on Board Game Geek of the the most uh, the, the best games, the highest regarded games based on user ranking. And at that time, I think it was Twilight Struggle was number one. I had a look at it, kind of, uh, oh, Cold War? Confrontational? That doesn't look like something that uh, I would be into. Uh, but second was Agricola, which... Uh, fa farming? Complicated uh, complicated farming? Well, that doesn't sound like something we're into. But it's really well regarded. I wasn't as, uh, as put off. I didn't really know that much about it. But yeah, as, as soon as <laughs> kind of uh, got my head around it and the original version of Agricola had you know a family variant that didn't include any of the cards and stuff uh, whereas yeah it's, it's uh, this kind of all of the Agricolas lumped together uh, it's revised or not Agricola is the the kind of the ultimate in all of the farming games you have a lot of the stuff thematically that is present in all of the other things but we are we're trying to build a family farm here we start off with just a room and a couple of rooms and a couple of people in there we are trying to expand our farm we're trying to upgrade it with different uh, materials we're trying to have children which will then who will then go out and uh, work for us it is um worker placement in the more old-fashioned sense that there are these spaces there are more spaces added every round but you go to a space that space is blocked off there is no going there uh, for the rest of the round until everybody comes back and uh, there are certain spaces that will just reward you with a static thing some spaces like say wood will build up round on round until a point where you think oh, i don't really want wood at the moment but i can't leave that for the the other players it's it's too good uh, to take there there is uh, 
vying for first place. There's um, vying for all sorts of stuff, especially later on in the game when it's uh, being able to expand your family, especially there's a space that lets you expand your family without room. Usually you have to go through all the rigmarole of um, building more rooms and stuff. There's space for your extra workers, but there's an action space that lets you ignore all of that. Uh, building fences so you can take in more animals and stuff. It uh, all works beautifully in that sense, but the kind of key to Agricola, and Agricola has got a, a, a successor, a kind of sequel in uh, Caverna, which takes a lot of the fundamental things, a lot of the things I said there, you know, animals, crops, all of this stuff, and adds an indoor cave element where you also build rooms. Uh, the, the kind of, the, the fundamental thing of why, and I feel like maybe I should give Caverna another chance as an aside, uh, I haven't played it for years and years and years now and wasn't uh, that big of a fan when we did play it, but the thing that kind of sets it apart and the thing that I think sets Agricola apart and the thing that I love most about Agricola that uh, isn't even in any of <laughs> the other games that I've been mentioning is this kind of, this array, this smorgasbord of cards that you get given at the start of a game of Agricola, which I understand as well is uh, potentially a reason not to like Agricola, uh, but you get uh, seven of these occupation cards, seven uh, minor improvements, and you can, you can draft them and stuff if you want to make it fairer. Uh, I don't think I've ever played it with a, a drafting version, but you start off with all of these different powers, and then one of my favorite parts of the game happens right at the beginning where you start to whittle it down see the connections between some of the cards okay if i get this this bonus could feed into this this benefit can feed into this the resources i get from this i could use to build this and you start to get yourself a bit of a vague plan that is of course never going to come off uh, people are going to get in the way you're not going to get to do everything that you wanted in the order that you wanted to do it in and you uh, there's going to be a lot of adapting, a lot of uh, plan B and stuff as you go through the game. But I absolutely love the variety that comes from the combination of those cards. And you know, original Agricola came with a ton of cards. And I know that uh, it is uh, maybe a downside that revised Agricola, that updated the art a little bit and stuff, uh, only came with a few... Uh, comparatively few cards although it's had uh, expansion decks since that are really upping that count because you know, original Agricola had I don't know how many loads of expansions that by the time I got to it it was all out of print so I just had base game and I think a couple of promo things now at least all of these uh, things have been kind of separated but they are available for now so I'm looking forward to uh, to playing more at some point maybe in uh, in streams I don't, I've never done a video for Agricola this might be the, f the only video on the list, I don't think I've done one for Patchwork actually, this, might, this is one of the only uh, videos that I haven't actually done a playthrough for, because it's, uh, the, there are always other games that get uh, more votes when it comes to the playthrough votes. But yeah, I think it works absolutely beautifully. And another thing that I, maybe I should have said this right at the beginning when it was uh, Aura at Labora, that a lot of Uwe Rosenberg games, though some use different artists of course, uh, who are all fantastic in their own right, but there is something about the um, the Aura at Labora, at the Gates of Lo Yang, uh, Agricola, and, and many, 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 many more, many other designers he's done art for too. Uh, Clemens Franz, who I think is a fantastic artist, and possibly because of that kind of early connection, Agricola being one of the first kind of modern games as we were getting into all of this stuff, Whenever I see Clemens Franz art in a game, it always says board games to me. It always kind of, yeah, it always makes me feel at home right away. Uh, no matter what the game, absolutely love it. And always, uh, always a joy to see when I am opening up a new game. So there we go. That is 10 Uwe Rosenberg games. I know he's designed many, many, many more. What have I missed off? What are your favorites? Why didn't I talk about more of the Polyomino games? What happened to La Havre? Why don't you like Caverna again? Tell me how wrong I am and what your favourites are in the comments. But hey, it's good to talk about 10 of uh, my favourite games from one of my favourite designers. My favourite designer? Hey, I'm not going to tell you that now. That's saved for whenever the top 10 designers topic uh, comes up. Hey, maybe that'll be next. But I think there'll be, there'll be a top 10 towards the end of the month. 
some uh, some anniversary related thing because uh, the big fifth anniversary of the channel is coming up very soon thank you very much for watching this thank you for being around if you've been here for five years although any amount of time is great really isn't it tell people about their channel support me on patreon help me make more things thank you though for watching this and i'll see you for the next game bye everyone Thank <music> you.